Good evening. Welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Teva and Johnny G. How are you, man? Hey, man, I'm doing great, Sean. Thank you, brother. How are you? I'm not good. I'm not good. Well, we could do this. I know we're um, living the dream. Living the dream, brother. Living the dream. And now that COVID's over and you got a lot of music out, I want to talk about you got a lot of stuff out and you're doing a lot of stuff. Yeah. So we don't have to do a full deep dive history. I mean, just the interwebs for that. that. But, but for people that are new that uh, of, of my channel that aren't aware of you, um, you really became bigger hardline, but you were really become a bigger local guy. You did a lot of local huge things also with your brother earlier on. Yeah. Virtually hardline is where everybody probably knows you from. As yeah. The first so my, my career actually started at the ripe young age of 11. I was literally 11 years old playing professionally. Professionally means you're earning money uh, for, for your work. That's really the That'd true be- definition of a professional. Um, <laughs> write that down. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Who, I don't know who defined that, but anyway, that, so 11 years old, I started playing professionally mm-hmm. and, uh, I have now, so it was a, a group that morphed into a group called brunette, which was a very popular group on a sunset strip in California. We held all kinds of crazy records. I'm going to uh, try to you know, give you a quick yeah, synopsis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want people to get a little mini bio just so, so you can get a feel. Back. Yeah, I want people to be aware yeah. of you. You've got a lot going on. Yeah, so sure. So. And so Brunette was massively successful uh, in terms of breaking attendance records. We broke Van Halen, The Doors, every record uh, in, in venues in California. We held them, but we never got a record deal. And we never got a record deal because the music just simply wasn't ready. I was a young writer, just wasn't ready. And and now I see that. That actually, that group actually morphed into Hardline, uh, which also featured Neil Sean from Journey. So if anyone's familiar with Journey, Neil Sean was a guitar player. And now Dean Castanovo, who's in Journey, and Todd Jensen, bass player, who's in Journey also. I call him Journey Line because it's mostly (laughs) uh, Hardline. It's just missing myself and my brother. So Hardline was a a, a, a very successful uh, uh, group in the early 90s that was uh, overtaken by grunge uh, music that kind of put that whole style out of business temporarily. And um, but the fans remain. And that uh, album's called Double Eclipse. It was uh, it's pretty critically acclaimed album and, you know, millions of records sold and stuff like that. It was a great, amazing start of, of my career. Since 1992, and now we're 30 plus years, I have created 100 albums worldwide that I either wrote or participated on or fe- was featured on. It's amazing. I'm literally right here working on album 101 with Axel Rudy Pell, who's been a, a 25 year venture for me singing, uh, you know, old school metal, a German act, Axel Rudy Pell. A lot of people are familiar with the the, our big uh, remakes and plus all the, I don't know, I have 30, 40 albums with Axel. And in the uh, late 90s, I got involved in gaming music, which I knew nothing about. I've never played a game ever in my life, except for like Pong, because I'm an old guy and f- maybe Frogger. And I got involved with this company called Sega. And uh, Crush 40 is a band that I created with my uh, Japanese partner, Jun Sonoi. And we hold some of the largest, most epic hits of all times in gaming, uh, which was recognized even through uh, the Grammys for nomination (laughs) for Grammys. My career has been insane. And then right when I thought, you know, a hundred albums. I was actually at album 99. I thought, okay, maybe it's time to do some full-time fishing and just relax a little bit. But uh, the record company I'm with frontiers, who is a major supporter of, of, of uh, so many hundreds and hundreds of melodic, you know, rock bands and, and some, some That's what they, are, bands. Really. They, they are the AOR label at this point. I don't think. Yeah. They're it. Anybody, they're anybody it. They, more bands commercially at this point and it's not a difference yeah. of the labels but they got the biggest name i think right now yeah the catalog is over seven thousand songs yeah. and uh they really revitalized um re re rebirthed uh you know resuscitated yeah. you know whatever the adjective are so many aor bands and so they came to me and said um listen you have a metal voice 
Uh, you have a metal background. Some of my influences, Ronnie James Dio, who I did the last tour with Ronnie before he passed away. You know, Ozzy, Scorpions, you know, Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cult, you know, all these old school, you know, rock bands and metal bands. I want to do a, I want, you should do a, a metal album. And so that is the birth of album 100, Enemy Eyes and History's Hand, which has been the most exciting album to create since my first Double Eclipse album on Hardline. Right. So Enemy Eyes has been one of my favorite albums to date besides Double Eclipse. How's it doing? Like on the, on the chart, it's, it's a weird time. It's like, the rate things nowadays too is kind of weird with streaming and this so, and that. So out of the gate, it's kicking ass. Uh, we already sold out at a, a number of, of um, distribution oh. points for the mm -hmm. album so that's good it's a very good sign but just like any new group even though i have a, a history and i have a lot of experience it's still something new for many fans to either cross pollinate and love it because remember i'm you know i do the metal axel rudy pell stuff old school kind of richie blackmore kind of stuff and then i have my melodic hard line and i have my gaming music with crush 40 so it takes a little time for everything to sort of cross pollinate and then to grow new fans but Enemy Eyes is kicking ass out there right now. And let me tell you why, bro. This is because you're a musician yourself. Why it was so exciting to make this album. I literally went and I could show you because I've got the proof because I'm in my little studio. I went from literally, literally from paper mm -hmm. to the microphone and no turning back. So in other words, I wrote the lyrics um, and I wrote the melody and I recorded it at that time in space. That's it. Oh, wow. There was no going back saying, oh, I'm going to rewrite that. And let me just digest that. No, what you hear on the album is from my pen to the microphone done. That's it. The whole album. There was wow. no listening and I'm going to change this. No, I want it to be full, creative, spontaneous experience. Paper, microphone, done. No changing. And did so, you have any moments well, after doing that though, like before it was replaced, before it was released, did you were like, oh, you know, there's that one part, like, no, bro, no, oddly, 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 thank God, no, I'm like, I, I mean, listen, there's always something you hear back and go, oh man, I wish I would have pitched that a little better. See, I'm an well, old yeah, school that's guy. Right. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, you know like how to write normal. songs. A hundred albums, now, yeah. you know what you're doing. Do you not? Yeah. Just, and you, and you know, as a guitar. You know, as a guitar player, you would say like, oh, I wish I would have just held that note a hair right. longer. The, the phrasing you know. on it feels like maybe it was a little wobbly. Right. That's what I mean. Like something exactly. where you're like, oh, that, yeah. Right. You, you, so you, can, you can do that until you're, yeah. I mean, you could do that till you're blue in a face for, for many years. And uh, so uh, luckily I didn't have too many of those uh, reactions to want to go back and repair. Thank God. And it was just a really great spontaneous and fun i would like run downstairs and play for my family listen what do you think oh my god that is so killer i said thanks okay next and just knocked it out so it was a lot of fun and i and i see enemy eyes as prior to i should back up prior to my 11 year old start prior to that i was into i did a lot of off broadway so i was into to theater i had my own I hosted my own television show. I was a busy damn kid. I'm still busy. I, I really, I got to reconsider this fishing thing. But, uh, and so I, it's the first time where I wanted to combine the visual of theater and the music. And that's what en Enemy Eyes is going to bring live. It's not going to be four guys who jump on stage, sweat and scream and say goodnight. I'm going to create a very theatrical characterizations the whole thing where you come to see enemy eyes you're going to see a storyline in a show a visual like holy crap all these characters and things going on so it's it's taking some time to build we're quite sure we'll have that show on the road in 2024 i need 2023 wow. to get everything finished wow yeah insane insane well, amount of work because right? right? a lot of bands aren't doing that you gotta start on the east coast so i can check it out first yeah, exactly. Okay, man. <laughs> you, we'll have you hook that all up. And uh, I don't have a I lot of perks, but, but get your get your knee up. Come on, just you know, you know where I am. <laughs> Let's start it right here. I'm good with that. That would be great. 
And, you know, my focus has always been so Europe, Eastern Europe and and Asia, and I would love to focus more. I think, uh, you know, although the AOR thing is sort of really diminished as far as support uh, in America, there's not much radio playing AOR type stuff. What's what's Um, radio? The fans fans (laughs) are still here. Yeah. What's radio? Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's funny, man. It's it's, it's insane. It's changed. You know, here's my thing. I want to say a few things. So, like, so... With AOR and the fans, I think part of that thing, like when we step back, actually, when grunge happened, I think, think about our age. Uh, I'm 52. And when it, when it came out and, and metal, everything, also, it was just grunge. First off, music at that point was copying, 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 copying itself. It was eating itself alive. You saw the major bands, but you had a lot of bands copying it. So the, the banks, I mean, record labels, were, 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 were putting more profit and more people in front of the other bands. So it was saturating it. Then, a lot of a lot of that people were in college going into their first jobs. So financially, I think your job changed. And I also wanted the economy of time and money of that fan base at the same time of the overblowing up of when Grunge came in. Because you look back now, a lot of people you can't say, you know, your favorite Grunge albums, besides like Alice Chains and Pearl Jams, or a lot of them, no one really invested into music like they used to. And when right. I think when got older and, and our fans and the fan base got more successful, I mean, like career wise, there's a resurgence in music too. I think their yeah, economy true. changed. They are at school, true. they're working, and they're like, I want full albums again. I want a full show. You know, some of the grunge bands are good, not not dog at all. But I'm saying, but they want performance again. That's where I think rock came back. And Europe kind of always held strong to that. And I mean, the the, the, the place, not actually the band. I mean, the band probably did too, but, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, it's interesting, man. I, I uh, you know, I, we all go where the work is. That's yeah. That's for sure. And my focus has been outside of the U.S. because because of this situation. It's an interesting story. Take a country like Bulgaria. This is interesting for your listeners. Playing any music that was not Bulgarian music was recently, and I'm talking maybe within 15 years, illegal. If you played a Van Halen song and it was heard in public, you could go to jail. You were only allowed to play Bulgarian music. So think about that. When I do a show, I just did a show in Trutikan, Bulgaria. 8,000 people for a solo show in a small city. Um, and they're still wearing, not still, they just got ACDC, ACDC shirts, Van Halen, Scorpion shirts. It's like new That's exciting. to them. It's insane. So when you go there, it's like, whoa. It's brand new. So um, and then also as this thing that we call the information superhighway, the Internet becomes stronger, stronger and more powerful. Some of our what we would say third world countries or very poor countries now have uh, better streaming capabilities. And now so they're venturing out to listen to more music. So this whole thing is just it's it's incredible. But to your point. It seems that we've sort of have never really had that. We can't really justify like what is the music of the 90s? What is the music of the 2000s, right? Like we did in the 80s. 80s was the 80s. 90s yeah. was kind of like a mixed bag it's of like, what was mixed it? Bag, what, you know? Right, yeah. what happened? And now here we are, 2000, what are, where are we, 2022? So, and what what are we really, I'm confused. Is it really um, a genre-defying um, style? I mean, it's gotten back down to the fact where it's very commercial and it's very timed out, um, even for songs. I mean, they're like, when you're sending off songs, it's timed out to a beat. And 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 even Desmond Child, who's written how many billion big songs has he done? Oh God, he's yeah. still. When I spoke with him, he's still a slave to sending stuff in to these these labels, and they're like, "Don't hear a hit." We they just do like a collage chopped together of it, and and. Then, yeah, and I'm like, this is Desmond Child. I mean, when you have big songwriters right. coming, there should be like a pass. They should be like, be able to go around that gate and be like, yeah, all right, you're kind of show <laughs> yourself. You know what I'm saying? But no, yeah, it, I know it, what you mean. It, it's yeah. timed out to like it's it, it's got to have a beat, got a certain rhythm. It's got under the song anymore. And I think and, I think and, Diane Warren Diane Warren got the pass. Yeah, she, 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 she I think she got the pass. She she yeah, the pass. No, I know what you mean. I totally it, know what you mean. Yeah, it's not the same and. The diversification that you've done was was really brilliant, um, a musically, for for creativity, and for musical survival. 
Um, Thank you, bro. Yeah. It's allowed you to do a the brilliance of. I don't think you even realized because I wouldn't have known. Someone video game me that my kids are. I don't think I think you stumbled onto a gold mine by doing Crush Forty and doing video game songs. You're like, yeah, I'll do it. It's something fun. And also, you're like, what? This is bananas. That's exactly like, what happened. Yeah. So to me, yeah. that was like that was just probably like your golden your Wonka ticket, really. Especially when it came yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it it was probably some of the. I mean, I've sold a lot of records. Don't get me wrong, but that was really the pinnacle of like what I said before. How I was able to cross pollinate those fans, so they became like the Crush Forty fans became Johnny Gioelli fans, and so whatever I put out, they want to hear loyalty. it. And fan loyalty. loyalty. It, it, exactly. And so I haven't felt that loyalty since the 80s. Right. And that's why Crush 40 is so special. And I just did not understand what was happening. I will tell you a funny story. Not really a funny story. It was a come, it was sort of like a, a come to realization story. I was going to do an event, a gaming event. I like I love to do those. I do panels, I talk to the kids, I'll I'll play, you know, we'll do the whole thing. And a van with some other like famous YouTubers and stuff were on that van picking me up at the airport. And me just coming from my old uh, old school Italian Catholic roots, I got onto the van and said, hello, everyone. My name is Johnny Gioelli, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here on behalf of, of Crush 40. And the kids in the van, I call them kids because I'm 55, I'm an old guy, started busting laughing. And I'm looking around, I go, what are you laughing at? And they said, we know exactly who you are. You were our childhood. You were our safe space when we were young, when we played those games and we heard your music, you allowed us to be safe within our world. And I like, wow. went That's back to the huh? hotel. I called my wife. I called my wife. I said, I completely missed the mark on this. I did not at all realize the, um, you know, the the loyalty and what this music meant to so many people and kids at that time. And now I've watched these kids grow into becoming doctors. I have Crush 40s fans in medical school. I've got doctors doing their residencies and and I've tried to communicate with as many as possible. That was an epic period in my life, and it's ongoing. It keeps it going. We've got and people that don't know, let's just side note to them right now. Check out Crush Forty. It's good rock music too. You don't have to be a gamer. It's just good music. It's I'd say rock pop to Thank me. You. I I don't want to. Yeah, it is rock pop. Yeah. Okay, it's got good hooks. It's no, you know, I, it's that's, not, that, that's a fair fair assessment. Rock pop, yeah, for sure. Um, very enjoyable. You don't have to be like into gaming and stuff. It's just it's just good music, really, at this point. And that's you know across the board. And I think. Which is interesting because you do have the legacy feel with, with Axel um, over there. He's a great musician, great yeah. band, great, great, you have great music there too. People should check out that band, not just because of you, because because of him and the rest of the guys, the band. Um, yep. But you do, you have your, you kind of have your toes in different musical silos, which is kind of cool. Yeah, for it sure. It keeps you moving, for sure. you know, and it keeps you moving. Yeah. And, 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 and it's probably got you past the point of getting beat up by being like, like is there going to be an original? reading a hard line because like that's what everybody does and that's not even a question for me i don't really i mean you're the singer you're the voice of it you've been carrying it on so to me that's even it's not like a thing but all these other acts has probably allowed you to not have to always dip into that that repeatable question you know what i mean when you're like i've done all these things mm -hmm. huge things yeah i feel i feel bad for for actors who are stereotyped to being that particular character and that's what I've never wanted to be musically. You know, back in the in the late 70s and the 80s, you were frowned upon if you jumped from band to band. Like, oh, he's a band jumper. He's a band right. hopper. But these days, especially at the what I would say that, look, I'm, I'm not. Well, I, you never know what can happen, but I'm 55 years old. I've had an incredible career. And now for me, it's about. Uh, keeping people happy and using the music that I create to affect someone. That is more important than anything. I've made plenty of money. It's not about money. Um, there was a, a point in my career where, you know, you had to survive. So you hope to make money. But for me, it's about affecting someone, having something the way I write, uh, bring out good in people, bring out a great feeling and, and, and what have you. So 
that's where I'm at, uh, at my point in career. And and I like to work with as many artists as I can around right. the world. I, I'm not a band hopper. I've had these same bands for 30 years, but I like working with different artists. That's the great thing that this whole social activity and the 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 interweb, the information right. superhighway, whatever has done. I can connect with great musicians in Sri Lanka and and create music together. We never had that before. Hell, no. I didn't even have a cell phone when I was touring in Hardline. I'd tell my wife, okay, I'm at a pay phone. I'll call you when we get to the hotel. And she didn't know if I was alive or dead in between. You know, we just <laughs> did. So it's, you know, it's this such great stuff that's come out of being able to connect to, to the world and uh, being able to use my, my gift and my craft to uh, keep things going. I, uh, why not? I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to, well, you I wanna, should, you I should. I think well, the fact so. that people are our age and, and, and I think people are turning around or you get this, like this band needs this original person or they need this or they can't go anywhere else. It's like a lot of people that aren't in the music field. say you're at the same job now for 30 years. Wouldn't you want to work with somebody different? Wouldn't it be exciting? Why would you want your favorite creative person or some of your favorite artists to not be able to experience another creative force to allow them to keep being happy, Agreed. happy artistically. You're not having your day job working with the same knucklehead every day. How do you think it's going to be for an artist who's trying to create something inspiring for you? If they're not happy, you think yeah. you're going to get something? You know what right. I mean? I agree. Yeah, totally agree. On the same page, one million percent. Yep. I I mean I'm I'm I fully understand trying to you know create a new band and trying to break that band, uh, but for me uh i really i don't mean this in an egotistical way i don't have any ego whatsoever i'm no different than anyone else i sing um but i don't need to really prove anything to anyone i just want to create use my gift to create music and make people happy and that that's really that's my objective that's what i stick to and and you know uh, vocally uh when the fans tell me i'm done because sometimes yeah. a lot of singers that are out there don't realize they they anatomically and medically can't sing anymore. It's not right. working. And that happens with age or whatever, or abuse or whatever. When I'm to that point, the fans will let me know. And then I, 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 I go fishing. So. Fishing is going to be so boring for you. Let's be honest. You need to find a better hobby besides that. <laughs> you have to, you have to oh, start man. clean planning cast fishing. You'll be no, singing about music while you're fishing. Quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, and, uh, I, will, I will tell you that my hardline vegan Bandmate is not a fan of me going fishing, period. So there you go. So, you know, here, here's the thing when you say about your voice, A, because you take care of your voice, and there's two things. A, you're not, it's not an ego. And I don't think anything you know, if a musician says they know they're a good guitar player, you should know you're a good singer, you're a good songwriter, because you think the guy that, that's good at welding is like, yeah, I'm good at welding. Oh, you have an ego. No, it's only when you're like an artist and you're like, I'm good at painting, I'm good at music. That's an ego because you say it. Anybody else that does their job, I'm good at accounting. Yeah, come by my house. I'm good at it. Oh, listen to your ego. No, no, no. It's only on that kind of job. It's an ego. So to me, I'm saying there's nothing wrong with saying I'm good at something. Yeah, I can say that. You know, it looks weirder for you, but it should be. It's so different than being good at. I know. I know what you're saying. I, I spin it a little bit differently, and I recognize that it's a gift. I never say like, "Oh yeah, I'm really a great singer." Not just a I, I don't. Not just say, a gift, I, though. You work yeah. it. You work it. I and you it. have a voice that could be strong enough. That's... You could be someone like like the Sammy Hagar thing, where Sammy is what in the '70s, and Sam he could. Right, and he could sing off the leather off a tennis ball, of a, of a baseball. Right? How Incredible. strong is his voice? You could do that because you have a natural voice so, and you work it. So I sang with Sammy. I'll just tell you a little yeah. Sammy story. Oh, so do. we uh, back in Hardline, uh, Sammy uh, and his wife came out to a show, and we were covering a song that Neil and Sammy did uh, off a, a band called HSAS, and it was oh, yeah, top, yeah, of yeah. Rock, top of the Rocks. So. I said, Sammy, you want to come out and sing a, a couple verse? He goes, okay, Johnny, you, you take verse one and I'll take verse two. I said, okay, Sammy, cool. That's going to be awesome. So I'm singing. We're, I'll never forget this, bro. There's things that you just never forget in your career. And I've played every arena around the world. I mean, I've sold out Wembley. I mean, I've played everywhere, right? And you remember this stuff. I was playing in Marin County and... That's, uh, uh, you know, in, in Northern California. Yep. And Sammy's going to come out in verse two. I'm singing verse one. And all of a sudden I hear this. Ah, the crowd just just lights up. And I'm going, what am I doing? I'm not doing like, what. I'm like, cool. I look over. 
Sammy came out too early. So Sammy came out. There's Sammy Hagar on the stage. Crowd's going nuts. He comes over to me and he's like, take it. I'm like, what do you mean take it? Take it means <laughs> take the second verse. Yeah. He didn't remember any of the lyrics or anything on the <laughs> song. I'm like, so he just basically sang the chorus with me. And then after I said, Sammy, what the F? He's like, dude, sorry. I couldn't remember any of the lyrics. And I think I came out a little too early. I'm like, that was hilarious. Anyway, we laughed so hard. He goes, yeah, I just sort of just like, I just couldn't remember shit except for the title. We laughed so hard. But the point here is that his voice right? is so powerful and so loud. It's like he doesn't even need a freaking microphone. Wow. He's a powerful guy and what a great human that and is. great. What what experiences? It's and and the point that when you hear singers at, at that point, it's almost like you feel like they should be locked in the studio recording every single second they can while their voice is that good. Because right? it feels like at any minute, any minute, like I'm like, you need to keep this recording albums because at one point, let's say you're 76 or whatever, I don't know how old it is, and then you're 77, you can't talk anymore. That's fine. You've given us more than enough rock. But man, yeah. those few months, maybe you can squeeze out a few albums. Like Freddie Mercury at the end, he was squeezing that last album out. He you was could feel pumping it. that out. And yeah. it was good. And there was no loss to the, the vocal quality either. And you could feel the emotion. That's one of the most right. emotive albums ever, by the way. That last exactly. album. Exactly. Oh. Um, uh, you incre- can't get it without feeling incredible. It. So- so, you know, Hardline did a remake on our Life album and of with uh, Who Wants to Live Forever. You should yep, check it out. Yep. It's my, no, it's I my, actually do. It's my tribute. Okay. That, yeah. So that, that was my tribute. So we played Wembley. I got a, I have stories, man. We could be on for hours for your listeners, but I know we got to keep it short. Uh, we were playing Wembley. I was on tour with Extreme, the band Extreme. It was Hardline and Extreme. And... Uh, my wife hits me. She was my girlfriend at the time. She hits me. She goes, look at that guy over there. He thinks he's Roger Daltrey. I said, honey, that is Roger Daltrey. And <laughs> I mean, some of these experiences, but then we had our own catering. Like we literally would travel with our own ovens and we had cooks and the whole thing, you know, real rock star stuff backstage. We had tractor trailers filled with, with commercial grade cooking stuff. So that, that we had our, always our, had our meals and everything's insane. But anyway, uh, those were the days. I'm I'm going backstage after a sound check, and there's my now wife sitting with Brian May from Queen and his wife just eating and talking. And I stand, I, I'm standing and go, that's Brian May. That that's Brian May from Queen. That's Brian May. I mean, bro, the experiences, you know, I've never ever for one second have not been grateful for all of these things that I've, I've, I've encountered and witnessed and stuff. I mean, really a lucky and grateful guy, but at the same time, I've worked very, very hard on right. this craft. And I think that if you laser focus on what you really want to do, anything is possible. You just got to make it your focus. And I remember I remember being so poor, bro, that it was a luxury to have a nectarine and we would label it on our tour bus. It was Johnny's and my nectarine because I was going to eat that thing later. And it wasn't often that we could go and spend money on like fresh, special fruit. I remember those days, man. And, And the sacrifices made to be able to, you know, hone your craft and, and do what you want to do that makes you happy and makes other people happy. Anyway, that's my story sticking to it. That's a good story. And and the thing it, actually with Brian and, and this and, and you justify this and say it. And I'm sure you met Brian. He's the kindest person ever. Smart kindest dude. Guy. Right. Smart. And yeah. And, but the bigger and the more people you meet that are established in the rock world, I've noticed this now to some of the the, the younger musicians, um, different personalities, different ways of handling things. Because people would yeah. be like, oh, how can you talk to so-and-so? So they'd be like, someone, so they say a big thing, be like, hey, how could you talk to, you know, John? He said that. I'm like, just by using my mouth and words, and he has words, and we, we, we put the words together, and we have a conversation. But some people find it so unbelievable to speak to somebody because of that. And I'm like, you, I don't think people really understand that artists at this point, at this success level, are more calm to the idea of this not being a rock star thing, just being successful is part of their thing. But they're real people and that rock star thing is not the same. Brian May is one of the most, I don't know personally, I've heard from people, you know, that, or anybody, anybody I've ever met are more laid back. 
you know, than you would believe. I think more, you know, f- for sure, a-, a lot of successful artists want to be recognized as real humans. I remember being in a restaurant and a busboy just flipping out. And it was it was actually a little embarrassing. And I asked the manager if I, I could go back to the kitchen and wash some dishes. And he was like, what? I said, please, would you let me do that? And they, he said, absolutely. I got up. The kid followed me. I started washing dishes. And he was like, why are you washing dishes? I said, because I'm no different than you are. Right. I'm no different. Uh, I I have a... I have a, a career in music. I sing. Um, I, ha- I have a gift to share. But at the end of the day, man, I crawl into bed just like you do. I get a stomach ache like you do. Right. I get a sore throat. I go to the doctor. I get a, a prostate exam. I'm no freaking different than anybody else. And so I think, you know, to your point, we just want to be, it, we are more laid back and we, and, and, and more open to just, hoping that people just recognize us as you know normal humans but i want to you're successful you know, your craft and and yeah. they should appreciate that and if they see you outside of the work area besides the higher acknowledgement depending on what's going on they need to respect right. and i was it's my my, my soapbox I, I think you need to respect <laughs> artists so i i was, i try yeah. i think that artists shouldn't don't usually can say because they want to say it but i say it as a as a fan and a supporter of ours and you know and, and friends as, of artists that so you're just doing your thing. And it would be weird to them to be at work or coming thing and be like, oh my God, they're having dinner with their family and everyone's freaking out because they're your favorite accountant or you're like, you're like, I'm at dinner. It's kind of odd. You know, like it's it, it, it's a thing where it, it's disarming and, and people need family time time when they're not at work. You're not at work. And it's not an ego thing. It's just about if you're not doing your trade, you know, it's it's insanity to, to have somebody expect that or or to give you something. Um, I saw something yesterday and they, they, a fan got mad at them because they didn't give them something. They gave it to him, but they wanted to give it to him again. And they also they have enemies and they're writing bad things on blogs and just going crazy about it. Artists don't owe anybody anything. The transaction is you listen to music, you like it, it feels good. It feels good to you. It touches the artist. Everyone's happy. Right. Nobody owes anything, anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. I mean, there is that element of, you know, you when you sign up for this, you have to be aware that it's it's entertainment and people um see it more than yeah, music I think when hardline came times. out yes yes a hardline came up we're, we're yeah right especially the past 15 10, 10 15 years and now covid people just I agree. got to re- realign their their i agree you say, yeah. do what you want to be successful what do you think of successful is? if you're a guitar player you're playing guitar and you're playing down the street at a club and you're you're you're, you're happy with it that can be success. It's not That's to say success. success is not having a platinum album because usually you owe money. People think success is something in music. Go watch like five behind the music. You're right. You'll know what success in music is. It's not exactly having a record label. No, you're right. 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 You're it, exactly right. It, that You're exactly right. That's how it has changed today. And I like that. I mean, um, there are so many bands that I, that I hear that uh, are so incredibly talented and you question why they're not like a massive mm-hmm. you know success story but right. maybe to them they are successful so your point yeah. is well is well taken i mean i never mind i actually forget that i'm i hate this the old cliche of rock star but i forget that i am that and sometimes when i when i take my break here in america and then i fly back over to europe and i'm well, in a store in europe, yeah. Yeah, people are staring at me. I'm like, what? What are you looking at? And I forget. I'm like, they're like, we're a huge fan. I'm like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I forgot who I was for a second. And another great thing is, you know, after you play rock star and you come home and your wife says, take out the trash, please. And I'm like, wait a minute, I have people to do that. What am I going to take out the trash? <laughs> it's, it's like an ongoing joke. And and my wife will say, take out the freaking trash. You're I home do now. It. It's my kids. <laughs> my kids do it. <laughs> so yeah, but the kids do it. So it's fun. And you know, interesting. Speaking of kids, I have a a 26 year old beautiful daughter who has a you know her life already started and great career. And I have an 18 year old son who's in the university for business. And his playlist. I watch these younger kids. His playlist is so incredibly vast. Like he'll even he even has like like Russian rap music. He goes, oh, dad, there's a lot of killer artists. And even though I can't understand it, it's it makes me feel a certain way. I'm like, 
that is so inventive, so cool. I was never like that. I was like, I'm a rock and roll guy. That's it. And blinders. And I'm not listening to anything. And, you know, other than that, and I wouldn't listen to jazz. I wouldn't listen to anything. Really? So the kids today are so far ahead in their willingness to experience different, different music. And that makes it so much nicer for a creative person to be able to go way outside of their normal box of, of creative thinking, because it's now, and now he's taught me, my 18 year old has taught me that I can pull something, even if I don't like the song or I don't think it's structurally correct or it's right. out of pitch or, or something drives me up. There's something artistic in there that is cool. And I search for it. And it's just so cool the way the kids are just like accepting of all kinds of different stuff today not only and i'm not speaking politically i'm speaking yeah. musically yeah. just right. completely open to all kinds of of uh of various music it makes it really nice for for musicians who i'm not afraid to do something weird because i'm like oh, that's what i felt man it'd be like telling a painter hey no don't use the fuchsia color right. people don't like the fuchsia color you got to go more browns i mean who would do that right so it's just a, a cool lot of thing. People, that's, that's, a, that's the problem. That's the problem though with music. You know, you know, people would be like, "Nope, you're a canvas painter. You're this painter. No, I want to paint. I want to do art mediums." You know what I mean? You don't do that. And yeah. and, <laughs> and and hopefully, I would think that. And, and like one of the big goals of my show is I say a few things. A, it's, there's no such thing as guilty music. A, uh, a, the best bands serve the song, and and then right. you can pepper it. But but also, people need to be open. To, even if you don't like it, I have, if I have a diversity of artists on my show, you may not like my last artist. But you need to like like them as a person and understand it. Like if we get past the point where people are always making fun of Nickelback, like the joke was funny because it's just abstract joke. But the truth is, if you don't like Nickelback's music, I did a ton of bands of music I don't like, but I only make jokes about it. I'm not five years old where I gotta be like boosting my ego because I'm making fun of somebody. You just don't listen to them. You know what's laughing yeah, about Nickelback in their big houses and and their and their success, right? You know, good for them. Point right. is, we need to get past that. Nickelback is just an easy example. And it's, I'm not even a, we call a fan of the band. I couldn't probably tell you other songs, but I don't like the fact that people right. beating us up just because they don't like it. It's ridiculous. And, and people need to be yeah, I mean, okay. there's, there's, you're right. I mean, there's, there's, there's engaging in conversation that's meaningful about, look, I really don't like that. Here's why. And then there's rudeness and disrespect. Yeah. And that's for me is where I get a little I, uh, same same way. I mean, I get a little frustrated. It's like if you don't like it, just say I, I really it's not my cup of tea. And right. um, when we were younger, you know, it was I, I want to say it felt like it was different too. Like almost like you're like Van Halen, and Van Hager, Van, this guy sucks. When you say sucks means my opinion's better. But now it's gotten to the point, and I think the, the internet has amplified it to a point where like saying it sucks, like literally means it's personal and it's this and they're the most horrible human being. It's not the same as saying I disagree. Like the word connotation what words yeah, means right. change at some level. As soon as yeah. it's like the fun teasing of music, it's like with actually uh, uh, sports. I don't follow sports, but sports guys do it too. They get so crazy about it. Like it, the, the fun back and forth, the banter has changed to this ugly monster. You know? Right. Yeah, no, good point. You're right. You're right. It's interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting it world is. we live in. It is, right but now. it goes back. And that's why I one of the things I appreciate it, in the conversation is, is very steered towards, towards your career because you have a lot of different types of music. And it's allowed your fan base to be a lot more open, which is something not a lot of artists can experience. You know, I'm very lucky. I will tell you, I'm extremely lucky uh, that I have the support of uh, fans that I do. I mean, I have fans all over this beautiful world. And they, like I said before, they, they cross pollinate to anything I do. They may not be like a, like, oh, that, you know, that, that was cool. Uh, right. I respect it. It may not be on their top of their playlist, but they're there because they're they're open to hearing everything yeah. that I produce and that's I create. Like that or just, at least I appreciate mean, that's it. Yeah, you know? it's unbelievable. It's you unbelievable. at least have to respect an artist doing that. And I think, yeah. So, what do we have for music coming out before the fans kills for us having this old man talk? Get off our lawn. Um, so here we go oh, so here, what do we have we have uh what's next okay album number 101 will be a new axel rudy pell ballads compilation where we're doing a number of old school covers like dust in the wind that oh, i'll really? remake with my voice yeah so it's going to be a really great ballads album that is i'm literally in the studio today uh finishing by saturday that album 
uh, January starts a brand new Hardline uh, album for production. So nice. our Hardline's, I don't know, seven, eight album. I don't, I can't, I've lost track. Um, that happens in uh, January, the writing uh, production uh, for a 2024 release. And then 24, we'll start a new Enemy Eyes <laughs> album uh, for a 25 release which is interesting. I am, I am booked. I am so busy, bro, which is just also incredible. Um, with crush 40, um, you know, the, the James Carey Sonic movies, yep. they're working on uh Sonic three now. I'm not quite sure exactly uh, who's going to star in this one. Uh, but there's talks of crush 40s involvement with music there. And nice. we're writing songs there. So, I mean, there's just so always so many moving parts. I wake up and um, I have different things <laughs> to it, to it, to attack every day. I mean, I've got, I'm off February. I'm off to Chile, uh, South America. I've got San Paulo. I've got, you know, cities in, uh, uh, in Brazil that I'm doing shows March and uh, April. I'm sorry, April and May. I'm in Europe, June. I'm in Europe, July. I think I'm going to do some fishing, going back on a fishing thing. August, uh, I'm back in Europe. I'm, I'm booked. I've got Australian tour. I mean, I'm, I am solid to 2025. So I stay in the gym. I do a lot of running and I got to stay healthy. And if so I, I did can... that right now, my back would throw out. I'd lift my back out right now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You're young. I my shoulder. I was lifting furniture this past weekend. I feel like I got two flu shots on my arms. I'm like, I'm so out of shape. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> okay. Well, then you got a good excuse. That hurts. So yeah, for so, me, it's about trying to stay healthy so that I can keep doing no, this, this, have this momentum to make the fans happy. Because that's really the ultimate man is seeing their faces live. So uh, all this music is great putting it out there. But when you see their reaction, when you're playing live, that's f for me, it's everything. So the tours are already okay. basically sold out uh, for next year. And that's always exciting to know that the fans are waiting. So anyway, for for your listeners who have, who don't really know who I am, uh, they should uh, do a little poking around. I think so, Good. I'll put the links up there, too, on the podcast part and on this for different people like different things, YouTube and stuff. But I thought it was important. I want to thank you. you you're very much an open book, and they can go, there's a lot of interviews out there where you're, you go very deep into the history uh, of, of these bands, which is fantastic, and people should check them out. And uh, People should support also, support other podcasts and support other shows and support Absolutely. everybody. There's, I mean... I am the best, but everyone else is pretty good too. Not just joking. <laughs> no, you should, seriously, you should support everybody because I listen to a lot of good stuff. But I don't want to retread. And the point is this: thank you for sharing a little bit more of opinions sure. and more of a, of, a, of a conversation. So maybe fans that haven't heard this part of you, or you know what I'm saying, yes. a, 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 a different exposure of, of of an attitude and to think things sure. a little differently too. Of of oh, this is who he is. You know, oh, we do have we we were, before the show we were talking about our 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 our, our love of our elderly dogs and vets. Right. People are people. You know what I'm people saying? Are people. It's true, man. No, these are great. And the other, to your point, you know, I interview with whoever wants to talk. I don't look at how many views, how many subscribers. I don't care if you want to talk and you have, why would it be any different than a live show for me? If, no, if you have a perfect. thousand listeners, I have a thousand people I'm going to perform to. They're mm -hmm. all important. Every one of them. And so I, I support uh, all you guys out there taking your time and uh, look, I'm going to tell your listeners straight up. There isn't any big money in podcasts. This is, this is a, this is a love of, of, of music and, yeah. and a, a passion for uh, support. And so thank you, bro, for all you do for all of us artists. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I think, and that's, and that's what it is. And that's what it comes down to earlier with like, I don't check numbers. I've had people, uh, bands be like, Oh, newer bands. You know what I mean? What are your numbers? I'm oh, like, I um, really, I just spoke with like uh, Ian Anderson and I can name a bunch of other artists that, were, that didn't ask about numbers. These guys are legends and female legends. Yeah. And the bigger ones right. don't ask about numbers. They yeah. just talk. So we're that's what the talk. younger bands yeah. can look at. I mean, and, and, and then I think that's right. one of the things missing. I, I do see that a lot. If you talk numbers to me, I've right. different artists that on. They go, what are your numbers? I'm like, you know what? This isn't going to work out. I, I can't play. I'm yeah. not going to. I got numbers better than some of these artists they've had on, but on the podcast level, but I'm like, I'm not going to do a numbers game with you. It's silly. You know? Yeah. I don't, I don't care how many followers, mm -hmm. likes, hearts, clicks. Mm -hmm. 
I don't give a rat's ass because no. if there's one person that wants to hear about what I'm doing, then that mm -hmm. and that person that person deserves to hear what what's going on. So that's yeah. the way I roll. Brother, yeah. thank you, man. Happy holidays to you, your family, thank to you. all your listeners. Thank you, man. And uh, we'll the talk best. again. We we'll, we'll be back on uh, together when I'm at album 105, maybe. We'll go again. That'll be great. Thank you. Right. Be, be well, bro. Take care, man. Bye-bye.